So, uh, very good afternoon to all of you, and uh, I welcome you all to this uh, last session of the uh, conference. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Purvi Pokhriyan. Uh, she's the director, Institute of Law, Numa, a very good friend. And uh, <coughs> we also have uh, with us uh, <coughs> Dr. Richard Gupta. Okay, so it's elevation only. <laughs> I have not <laughs> detected anything. Anyway, so Richa is uh, uh, assistant professor at uh, MIT Law School, and then we have panelist uh, Dr. Mukul Rajada, uh, who is also an assistant professor at the National Law University, like the ETF. And uh, then we also have uh, two speakers in this uh, fashion. Uh, Swati Goshal is uh, assistant professor from MIT. She is with us. And Mr. Madhukar Sharma is not here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So Madhukar Sharma is uh, at Symbiosis. So three. So we have five, and I'm also supposed to give, but I like to keep in my limits of criminal law. And I am placing this session on, I am speaking on positive obligations in criminal law. How many of you have heard this phrase, positive obligations in criminal law? This is a uh, phrase which is generally used in the context of human rights instruments. And uh, certain liabilities are then, you know, unrestricted, are then made on the part of the state. So in criminal law, generally, we have been listening since morning and since last day that the criminal law has to, has not to be very repressive or it should not be punitive. We are talking about a positive criminal law. Now, positive criminal law is not about merely punishing the people. It is also about you know, conferring certain rights on the people. So my formulation of criminal law is essentially in, the, in this paper is the criminal law also confer certain rights on the people. Most of the cases, we think law creates liability, but law creates certain rights also. This is fantastic, you know, formulation. Positive obligations means entire conditioning of a student in criminal law is like that. An act is always punishable. We 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 think we always look at in criminal law the acts are punished, and there are certain obligations which are created by the same law where the citizens are expected to act proactively in certain situations and where you fail to do those proactive things, you become liable. So criminal law is an expectation also to behave in a certain way because law is a framework for conduct basically. So not always through preventing or punishing the act, but also expecting certain positive obligations. So what is positive and what is all? Positive means when a thing has not yet happened, you are in a situation we are likely to. So how many of you have seen Michael Sandel's lectures? Or they, many of you must have seen. So Michael says that you are standing on the corner of a tunnel, a train is coming, you want that to be stopped at, at the end of tunnel, five people are working and there is a fat man standing at the rally. You can push that fat man, stop that train, save the life of five. You know? Whether, what is, what is required? So in such a person is drawn, drowning in a lake, you are passing by, you are a good swimmer. What is the expected conduct? So, so there are duty situations which are created in this law. Criminal law is never read like that. I am giving a perspective. So I will take you through certain slides which are very interesting. Positive obligations is about respect for, this is a, you know, you please read this Lyra Lazarus paper. Uh, he, because uh, it is, he is uh, a great uh, disciple of uh, Ashworth and uh, he has written this paper in response to Ashworth theory on positive obligation uh, in criminal law. And he is saying respect for human rights in the pursuit of safety and security are the, or reduction of harm and reduction of the risk harm through the criminal law. 
uh, nature of criminal law, we have to see. I have just mentioned we are talking about criminal law. What kind of criminal law we are talking about? Reactionary criminal law or a positive criminal law? So, <coughs> moral, social, and political foundation of imposing positive obligation. Why positive obligation? So, at places like suppose you are in possession of information that your house is being misused for some criminal purpose. Or you are aware that a child is being sexually exploited. Or you are knowing that a person is possession of some explosives, which he may use at any places, and you do not act. You don't do anything wrong, but certain omissions are caused in the process. So omissions we have forgotten. You have never, you will never find any debate happening in this country on omission. We are so act conscious people. We have thought only criminal law in terms of act, but criminal law is also in terms of omission. And omissions are your positive obligations. Why omissions? In no class I am telling you in criminal law, no teacher teaches the moral, social and political foundation of imposing political obligations through omissions. Why? You ask any student what is the jurisprudence and philosophy behind positive omission. And in certain situations, it's not the individual alone who is under positive obligation. It is the state. The state is also under certain positive obligation. Like it is the state duty to prevent the harms against the citizen. And therefore, a duty is cast on the state to take necessary measures to see the well-being of women, children, citizens, your safety, your security. So the state is liable. So therefore, human rights framework relies on positive obligation. So suppose United Nations framework or the European framework, they are expecting certain duties to be performed by the... And there are reciprocal duties of citizens. So criminal law, the citizens are not always on the receiving end. They are also have a proactive role to play. So are we thinking, we are, def we are defending ourselves against criminal law in most cases. Criminal law is outreaching, it is doing that. But what are you doing in criminal law? That is the whole issue. So let us see what Ashworth says. So two types of obligation Ashworth is talking. Individual, first is individual. Companies and other organizations, they are under certain duties. So companies are, they have to comply with so many things like uh, every company is liable to create a mechanism to see that women are not subjected to any har harassment. This is a public policy now for every company or organization. It's not that there are cases of uh, harassment in that company. But these are the positive obligations of the company. Positive obligation towards environment protection, towards several kinds of welfare things. Second, the positive obligations which rests with the state duty to have in place laws that give adequate protection to the rights. So it is the duty of the state. Duty to justice and duty to protection. This is, so the state is being obligated. Because when we debate criminal law, we have to debate in terms of the liabilities which this law is likely to create for the individual and for the state. Omissions. So I am, in this presentation, I am reading positive obligations through omissions. So according to uh, my contention that omissions are a form of, very expressed form of positive obligations located in the field of criminal. Omission means a failure to act. That means when a person is bound to do act, he omits certain things and deliberately neglects. It is called omission. That is a simple definition. And uh, the principle that Ashworth propounded, when omission becomes criminally liable. So if you do not act, so it is not your voluntary choice. You are under legal duty to act in certain situations. We have to see whether omission, all omissions which are formulated in the criminal law are those where a legal duty is created. So suppose uh, under uh, say uh, POXO. POXO, it is the liability which is created on the citizen if despite knowing an instance of sexual exploitation, if he fails, he or she fails to report it, you become criminally liable. You know? 
and it has there is a punishment for that so we have to see when omissions become criminally liable three principle ashworth creates because there is a debate whether omission should be criminally liable the person should be criminally liable for omission and if i can't act because i am not physically capable to jump into a pond and save somebody's life so even if that becomes an issue so principle of urgency sometime urgency is so acute that person sitting next to you carrying a lot of material which could be harmful to the general health and welfare of the people and still you do not urgency priority to life when life is in danger you know so even the if you see the right to defense right to defense involves defending your life and anybody else's life who is there in your proximity you have to act so when life the question of life is involved that's why michael sandal comes in picture he he poses some difficult question whether you will act or not and principle of opportunity and capacity you should have an opportunity to act in that situation and you also you should be having capacity this is what ashworth has formulated let us see how this you know played out should omission be punished or not this is the question rational of criminalizing criminalization of omission because many people say there are opponents of ashworth was of the opinion that omission should be uh, punishable whether acts and omissions are equally blameworthy because generally we think the general parlance omissions are not as blameworthy as that so suppose you act then you are doing wrong but when you do not act you think you are not liable but but this is the question so in what circumstances should a person said to have an affirmative duty to act reinforced by the criminal law please i think this question must be asked so in what circumstances second what is the appropriate intensity of criminalization to what extent it should be punishable whether omission offenses are more intrusive that then please read that then prohibitive ones so most criminal law is preventive and prohibitive criminal law says if you indulge an act of theft you will be liable for that so it is prohibitive but omission offenses are intrusive means it is forcing you to act in a particular way so it is against your voluntary will so suppose you do not act when you are supposed to act you are not saving the lives of so whether non savers are as blameworthy as killers who oh, ashwar has this question whether non savers i mean those who are supposed to save they are as blameworthy as killers so killer is killing the person but non saver is not killing but he becomes a factor to kill so 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 what kind of liability is then you know imposed in such cases is the question that the ashworth is asking he is a supporter for the punishment uh, uh, for omission and as i said but he talks of two different views criminal law should not punish people unless and until there is a clear serious case he said this secondly he said social responsibility views there are times and situation where people help one another and further says that individuals need others and people living in the same society does owe some duties to others he said a very beautiful thing he has said he said every omission you know uh, causes a duty situation if there is omission means there is a duty we have to find out whether um, all the all omissions may not have a duty situation if it is so then probably it may not be criminally liable but to my mind whatever is provided in the law because law is not very clear i am telling you indian criminal law is not very clear on the subject of omission because we i don't know we have already decorated it here and there but you will rarely find any omission being punished further three more duties on the list he said duty to assist those in peril duty to take reasonable step towards law enforcement so even suppose you uh, fail to uh, help anybody means you are uh, like like helping a, a police officer or a law enforcement and in even the uh, said, uh, giving information to the police officer about the case and all that 
So uh, I am coming this dual duty situation. So Ashworth says these are four very important duty situations where criminal liabilities emerge and where positive obligations are located. So there are family obligations. In family obligation, duty of parents to provide necessities of life for their children. So even many cases the courts have punished the people where the family members have failed to take care of the elder people, children. So it becomes an offense because you are family obligations under family. Duty of members of household to protect children and vulnerable adults. Voluntary incurred obligations where the possession of hazardous material and inflammable to protect people from danger and to disclose certain information to the government. You are supposed to disclose a lot of information to. So these are the voluntary incurred obligations which you have to. Obligation arising from personal uh, responsibility. This is also very important. Like duty of a person delivering from a chosen situation or from non chosen situation where then one is uh, causally responsible uh, to take steps to deal with danger, like unintentional be causing dangerous situations. So if you are not, if you, if you fail to act, you save people in that. And there are also certain civic obligations relating to environment, relating to assisting the government, relating to maintaining so many things, reasonable efforts to ascertain the criminal law. So duty of all person to make reasonable efforts to ascertain the criminal law. These omissions are these duty situations are positive obligations located in criminal law. Uh, where a duty arising from a statute, sometimes duty is arising because defendant was uh, under duty bound uh, by a specific statute where he has to act. Sometimes he is bound by a contract. You have a contractual liability. I am sorry, I will not be able to explain it. Then you also have duty arises from a relation I have just mentioned. And there are certain situations, I will just end, that where uh, we find that uh, the Ashworth says that the scholarship in this area is gradually emerging. But he said, uh, Lucia Jedner, uh, responding to Ashworth theory, he said that we are worried about the spread of preventive justice model of criminal law. Preventive justice model of criminal law and positive obligations in criminal law are the two different poles. Most of criminal law, what we notice in our context, is a preventive model. Because it, it declares that if you indulge in this act, you would incur this and this land. We prevent it so that you do not indulge it. But one part of criminal law which is largely under oblivion, largely eclipsed, is the criminal law which poses positive obligations on the citizens. Uh, I would, with this, I am only saying this that I have not dealt with states' obligation. Probably Mukul is dealing with that. Deliberately. So there are several states, so all the human rights instruments, international instruments, they cast certain duty on the part of a state to act in a particular way, like torture convention, like uh, juvenile justice, uh, you know, or relating to standards of justice related. So, so many conventions have been framed where member states have signed. If a state failed to those, you know, adherence to those, means you are not doing with your positive obligations which are the part of this convention. So I think this is very ignored area in criminal law. Why I am fascinated about this as this particular territory in criminal law creates certain obligations on the part of citizen to act in certain situations. So it is not merely that these liabilities are created when you are acting. These liabilities are also created when you are not acting. Thank you for your attention. So, so friends, we can have some discussion in the end. Probably yes. that would be fine. And uh, I would request if you have any question or query, you can note it down and I will come back soon to you. Uh, with this, I invite uh, Professor Purvi for her presentation. Uh, Purvi is a director of a very progressive and fast developing institution 
called Nirma University Institute of Law. I have uh, been okay. I had occasion to visit uh, that institute so many times, and I I am full of praise for her dynamic dynamism and leadership, doing lots of innovations at the law school, uh, Professor. Thank you, Professor Bajpay, for your kind introduction. Uh, the chair, my fellow panelists, and uh, distinguished uh, participants. At the outset, uh, I would like to reflect upon a few things. The first and the foremost, uh, thanks to Professor Bajpay and National University Delhi, that uh, we could explore some of the critical perspectives of criminal law. I know for the last two years, uh, you know, Professor Bajpayee is holding this kind of a conference every year on criticality of criminal law, and we had Professor Alan Nori and others. Friends, when I look at this uh, two-day schedule, and uh, when I was going through the different sessions and the presenters, you know, there are 22 female presenters and 11 male presenters. That made me to think what is the nature of criminal law and who is very much worrying for the criticality of uh, criminal law when it comes to India. Whether the nature of criminal law is something which is empathetic and the women empathize more to the issues. That is what the first critical reflection I would like to share with. And friends, if I recall uh, some of the sessions which we had yesterday, since yesterday we have witnessed uh, discourse uh, challenging the model of existing criminal law and criminal justice administration for all good reasons that it is not time effective, it is not cost effective, it is not appropriate, it is not justifiable. To that extent that Professor Bakshi had gone to label it as a criminal justice, criminal injustice administration mechanism. And in this context, when I was uh, discussing with Professor B. V. Pandey yesterday in the morning, that we were discussing that what is how the criminal law is perceived in law school, whether the students and the faculty members are taking keen interest in criminal law and teaching learning process. And he uh, proposed a very powerful uh, idea that, you know, and I discussed that, you know, this is a traditional law. Nowadays, students are more interested in court law and international law, which is so fascinating area, IP law. You know, the criminal law, the property law is something, uh, there's not more placement, the so-called quote-unquote, and people are not that very keen. So and he says, he suggested a very in interesting um, phenomena that this, this is something we should, uh, we should work upon. Because if you look at the present context, there is a unilateral uh, use of force by the state in the name of uh, coercive power, in the name of establishing just and fair society. So basically how the present, in the present context, the criminal law is governing the state and its citizen through the subject matter is, is, is a very important uh, phenomena and because how the criminal law has changed its dimensions in, in, in the present day era, particularly, you know, we are adding on more number of times. We discussed uh, yesterday about the over-criminalization and in some instance, under-criminalization. So these are the few things that, that we need to discuss that what uh, Professor Pandey had uh, very categorically mentioned. And in that context, you know, again, Professor Bakshi, if you, if you recall, he said that are we a civil society or are we an evil society? And how can we march from evil to civil? So these are the very important uh, reflections. And keeping these reflections in mind, uh, I was trying to write a paper. This is a working paper. And the title of the paper is Limiting the limit of the state caution, can we democratize the criminal law? So this is a working paper. I would like to read the paper and I'm trying uh, to pose so many critical questions through this paper which we can discuss at the end of uh, uh, the sessions if the time permits. I would like to start with John Stuart Mill's famous concern on liberty. He said, what is the nature and limit of power which can be legitimately exercised by the society over individual. 
Now here our concern is power exercised by the state by means of criminal law. So now the new question that comes, what sort of a conduct state legitimately make it criminal? Here the important word which I am trying to highlight is legitimately make it criminal because we are discussing about the limits of criminal law. Now as per mean liberty is simply an absence of caution and he categorically says that when coercive law sto stops, liberty begins. And Meal is impressed with the idea of extra political forms of social control and extra legal forms of political control. And in this context, Professor A.C. Tan points out Meal that extra legal caution is far more pervasive than the use of legal penalties because it leaves little room for escape and penetrate much more deeply in the details of life and in fact it enslaves the soul itself. So keeping these in mind, if you look at the present state of affairs in, uh, in Indian Penal Code and particularly focusing on the criminalization, I feel uh, criminalization is a very costly affair. Why is it a costly affair? Because as we all discussed yesterday also, that it stigmatized the person and it also bring along with it so many other parents, you know, it affects the reputation, the job prospects, the parents, the family members. And that's the reason that Fenberg in his classical work, you know, Professor Bajpai also mentioned yesterday, that in the classical book of moral limits of criminal law, he used very powerful term. And he said, when a particular legal prohibition oversteps the moral legitimacy, it is a serious moral crime. He used the word, he coined the word moral crime. So this paper is addressing all the issues. What is that moral legitimacy which we are talking about for limiting the Indian criminal or for limiting the criminal law per se? So now the question comes that how to determine the legitimacy of the exercise of the power and what are the moral constraints on legislative actions. Do we provide some moral guides to our legislators? Do they undertake some kind of a training of the moral philosophy before they legislate law? So now there is a shift in approach to criminal law. We have been talking about utilitarian concept of criminal law for all these years. In all 20th century, we have been talking about utilitarianism. But now there is a shift from utilitarian concept to legal moralism. Now what is this legal moralism? As I said in this book, Fenberg, that, that whole work is on the moral limits of criminal law, inquires the valid principles to limits of the criminal law and he lays down two situations. He says there are some constitutionally permitted statutes as we find in India as well. There are some constitutionally permitted statutes might not be morally legitimate. However, they are not less legal. There is one kind of a situation. <coughs> and the other kind of a situation is there are some morally permissible or in fact required statutes might not be constitutionally permissible. And he further asked that is there any overlap between legal validity and moral legitimacy? Or if there is any overlap, what are the overlaps between the legal validity and the moral legitimacy? As I said, uh, we do not provide any moral guides to the legislatures, but do the courts have the scope of moral wisdom? And the Finkberg noticed in his work that constitution does provide, maybe the Indian constitution or the US constitution does provide the Supreme Court with a limited supply of some blank checks. Now what are those? Like while interpreting courts apply its own standards, its own wisdom. Let's say for example, what is reasonable or unreasonable search or seizure? What is cruel and uncruel punishment? What is just and unjust compensation? 
what is excessive or unexcessive fine what are legitimate and compelling state interest because there is always a conflict of interest and you know what is legitimate state, state interest and what is compelling state interest so while dealing with all these kind of an issues courts does have the power and the scope and the room which is been provided by the constitution itself that they they can apply the moral principles but when it comes to the legislatures whether the moot question is that whether they do apply this kind of a principle when it talks about the indian constitution i would say i mean uh, it's my understanding that article 13 does provide to some extent a limited extent of moral legitimacy on the legislatures and uh, that's what professor pandey if you recall uh, the discussions uh, when we are discussing the triple talaq case why we didn't challenge why the argument was not being made under the pretext of article 13 that was a whole range of issues now in this regard uh, there is an interesting uh, debate which is a classical debate between devlin and professor hle hart this debate over morality of conduct is very noteworthy and devlin says immorality of conduct is sufficient to justify criminalization that what devlin's point of view and professor hle hart argues that immorality is ought to be insufficient that's not the sole reason to punish a person and the question comes whether the harmful because we have been propounding the harm theory you know till all these years now harm theory has its own defects so the question comes whether the harmfulness of a conduct is sufficient for criminalization and to this to this the packer has responded that harmfulness is to be coupled by community condemnation now harm principle has been stretched if you look at this community <coughs> condemnation then we can say that that the harm principle has been stretched to harm principle should what the harm principle should require is not only harm which is sufficient is also coupled with community condemnation or whether harm of certain sort or seriousness of harm you know if you recall the way professor vedh kumar is discussing yesterday that how we do how do we classify the crimes you know do we do we operate some standard principles and there are certain parameters up you know we have been talking about the gravity of the offense but is there any theoretical underpinnings on the classification of a crime now devlin uh, said it's a very important uh, statement which he said that shared morality is crucial you know, we shared morality is very very crucial to the existence of society and that society is therefore entitled itself by enforcing that morality through the criminal law so that what we have been observing in terms of section 377 and even the old debate of marriage break he said conduct is immoral enough to be criminalized where average person when he, and he try to explain what is community condemnation and how can we how how how, how can we make it more explicit he try to make it explicit that where average person views it with a particular strong feeling feelings of intolerance and disgust to this uh, i have to propose with with reference to devlin's proposition that is this possible for india my my questions to all of you because uh, we all live today in the era of manufactured mass movement i would say the manufactured reactions to every situations i would like to extend the theory of non stream scale to manufacture consent to the manufactured mass movement and reactions and manufacturing manufactured consensus because we know that uh, uh, we can uh, definitely polarize the society through artificial insemination of ideas and you you can make people react and we have seen in the recent past the threat and so all the kind of a bans you know they made big ban or ban on the dance bars or you know we had held number of issues so whether this kind of a situation is 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 possible in india but to this professor hle hart to this proposition of devlin professor hle hart replies that the feelings of disgust or intolerance must always yield to logic and reasons 
it should not be just emotional. He categorically mentioned that we should subject our feelings to the rational scrutiny as they might be based on ignorance and prejudice. And that's the reason that uh, Mr. Packer, in his very famous book, book of criminal, uh, uh, criminal sanctions and criminal limits, sorry, limits of criminal sanction, he made four arguments. He says, conduct should be criminalized only if it is widely viewed as morally condemnable, the same way agreeing with the devil. Then he said, conduct should be criminalized only if it is harmful to others, the same applying the harm principles. Conduct should not be criminalized simply because it's immoral. And fourth, he said, conduct should be criminalized only where doing so likely to reduce the incidence of such conduct. And we have seen this proposition in India, the whole story of making uh, rape, uh, I mean, uh, punish, punishing the rape with the death penalty when it comes to the um, uh, so whole debate which we have uh, recently seen, even with reference to the Juvenile Justice uh, Act, is the concrete example of this. Now, according to Finberg, apart from this, this is something what Pecker has said. Finberg says, apart from the harm principle, there are three other good and relevant reasons to support the penal legislation. And he gave another three principles. He says, if one should have a penal provision, if it is reasonably necessary to prevent hurt or offense to others. The same way, he has propounded the offense theory, uh, apart from the harm, in the second book of uh, him. It is reasonably necessary to prevent harm to person to whom it prohibits, whether it is it is helping me as a perpetrator of crime. And third, it is reasonably necessary to prevent inherently immoral conduct, whether or such conduct is harmful or offensive to others. And he gave a number of uh, examples to this. And uh, he also talks about uh, uh, this is very interesting phenomenon. Legal paternalism, you must have, uh, have heard of this. That you know, when I impose, when, when I impose some kind of a penal uh, sanctions on the victimless crime, so I, on, on all this victimless crime, you know, probably state is trying to impose as under the pretext of the legal paternalism. Now, with the help of these principles of Devlin and Fenberg, the task for us is how to establish a legitimate criminal law because it's not a policy document. We have been observing this criminal law as a policy document till now. But you know, the whole, not, the whole utilitarian concept is, is missing its relevance today because it's not serving any purpose. You know, despite, we have seen all, we discussed this thing yesterday also that on NCRB data, crime has been constantly increasing no matter what kind of punishment that you are suggesting. So in this regard, uh, the work of Michael Murray and uh, Anthony Duff is also very important and they have tried to expand the legal moralism principles. And the moralism of Michael Murray and Anthony Duff shows criminal justice to be an enterprise that takes seriously the offender's right not to be used as mere tool for the deterrence of undesirable conduct, which we have been, when it comes to India, we are reactionary society. You know, what happened in 2002 in Nirbhaya case, we immediately reacted to 2013 amendment. What we have seen in the attack on the Taj, we, uh, on the parliament, we immediately, uh, you know, uh, uh, enacted the National Investigation Agency Act to be basically a reactionary society. Uh, so this, and probably, you know, our basic uh, assumption is, I mean, our, our basic uh, objective is just to create a deterrence effect in the society. Now, from this principle of construction of the limitation of the criminal law, how we can move forward for creating a notion of democ democratizing criminal law? And when we talk about democratizing criminal law, there are four essential principles which I would like to discuss. And uh, these principles are in the form of the questions. And I'm not going to answer <coughs> these questions. Probably we may discuss these uh, questions if the time for me to the end. The first question, is there any notion of community view of justice? 
Uh, I give the simple example. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, example. Uh, you must have heard, some of you must, must be aware that there is uh, an NGO called, called Seva in Ahmedabad. So we had one, uh, you know, uneducated lady who had come and said, uh, and she was uh, complaining, you know, there is a center for, I mean, there is a uh, legal uh, counseling center for women. And she was complaining that uh, today I was bitten up by my uh, brother-in-law. He said, you know, if at all, if anyone has a right to beat me, it can be my husband. How can my brother-in-law beat me? So the concept which I'm talking about is, is there any community view of justice? If at all there is a community view of justice, whether it is relevant for criminal law, for considering the criminalization under the uh, notion of criminal law. And the third question is, why should criminal law care what community think is just? Whether the criminal law should think, care for them, or they should not. Or rather, the fourth question is, should criminal law deviate from community sense of justice? Whether the criminal law can work independently than what the people is thinking, what is moral condemnation, what is the community <coughs> sense of justice? So if you try to answer these four questions, probably we'll be able to dis determine the moral legitimacy of the legislatures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kuzbi. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, presentation, uh, especially raising uh, some very pertinent debates, which are of course the part of uh, our core you know, engagement here, especially the democratization of uh, criminal law as such and the community sense of justice, and also the thesis which you have propagated based on fan works, moral limits of criminal law. And uh, uh, if you see very carefully that even the Supreme Court is faced with these questions in so many situations. They may not be able to articulate the, the manner in which we are discussing here. I remember when Sangeet versus Haryana was decided in which the death penalty question was involved. 